<laughs> you know, because he's on my. It's pretty funny. How many subscribers do you have? Huh? A little bit under 200. I'll look. You're you're pretty good. Maybe I can't remember. I just had one today. One what? Or one like one at lunch. A what? All right. So, what happens here? Okay. So when prices begin to drop because over overproduction. What happens? What does everyone do when prices start dropping? Uh, they, 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 they start to produce more. Produce more thinking we'll get ourselves out of this hole. And when they start cutbacks, what drops right here? Demand. Prices and demand. Because that's and that ties in here with inflation. And we call this downward trend in prices, profits, wages, a deflationary curve. So signs of deflation is a very bad thing. And it's not necessarily saying that it's going to be deflation. And today, in the modern world, that could just be really, really low inflation, like less than 1%. That's like, ooh, you're right. That's deflation. That means in some areas you have deflation. So that's this. To, do we get to mention credit freeze? Yeah. So we got the bust. Yeah. And I listed all of those things. Oh, we got through all that. The wages. Everything begins to go down. Optimism tanks, right? Well, here's the biggie. What happens to debt? Debt actually goes up. Why does debt go up? That's, they think of it, especially here. But even when they're even they quit, um, you know, they might be borrowing more just to get through. But even people who have money, I think, oh, let's go pay back our debt. So if everybody, including businesses, is trying to pay back their debt at the same time, so you have a combination of people losing money, have to borrow. You know, like credit card bills go up just to make ends meet. But also, if everybody decides at the same time to pay back their debt, what happens? <laughs> if everybody decides to pay back their debt at the same time, what does that do to demand? People were buying products. Now, we're putting it in the bank. Demand drops. So you have a combination of people needing money, come on, everyone else trying to pay back their debt. If demand drops, won't that make prices go down lower or cutbacks? Wages drop. So it's literally everything open. So individuals, their debt might go down, but for a country in a depression, debt goes up because everybody pays their debt off at the same time. It's a paradox. If we all try to pay back our debt, be responsible, our debt will go up. And one more thing. If there's deflation, that means you're paying back money of greater value. So your debt just went up. And lastly, what happens to the US government? What happens to tax revenue? Not just US government, but state government, city government. What happens to tax revenues if there's a bust? What's that? Tax revenues drop like a rock. People aren't making as much money and about spending as much. Tax revenues drop. Government debt goes up. So debt's going up everywhere. And if everybody says, oh, our debt's going up, let's pay back our debt, what's going to happen? It'll get worse. There's a name for it. It's called debt deflation. And it's really debilitating. We went through that 2010, 2011, 2012. Nationwide. And so, bust. How do you get out of it? <laughs> exactly. Boom. Okay. Problem solved. Everyone's already stopping to produce. So that's the thing. They were overproducing here. Now, no one's buying. No one's producing. They could produce stuff, but no one's buying the stuff. They could supply goods, but why if there's no one there to buy it? They're in this situation right here, and that's the way it is in every bus. How do you get out? Something has got to get demand going. There could be a lot of things that get demand going. War does, yeah. War does. Now, war is not very sustainable growth. In fact, it's pretty bad growth. 
not only is war shockingly expensive in every way you can imagine, but also, you know, you think about it for a second. All right, we'll build a tank. We need all the workers to build a tank. Then what? Now I got the tank. You <laughs> said tank. Yeah, really. What can a tank make? Dead A tank can make dead people. Can't do anything with a tank. In fact, what's the base case scenario? It's something you get rid of. Because we have a lot more expensive than music than not music. How would you ever want to get rid of a tank? You know what they did with over you know what they did with over ten thousand tanks? Cold War era M60 tanks? They're on the right track. To make a dive for a channel for the Mississippi River, they put ten thousand tanks, stacked them up for a channel. Ten thousand M60 tanks that were about eight hundred thousand dollars a piece in the sixties and seventies. That's a shockingly expensive way to build. <laughs> but they don't know what else to do with them. They're obsolete. See, the military is saying, oh, yeah, we look, wait, then what? You know, it's the same as, you know, it's not quite just digging money into a, digging money in a well and digging it out, but it's pretty close. Wait, some continuous tanks, right? Sure. Yeah, they're just tanks stacked up. Sure. But what has to happen, though, you're on the right track. Something has to stimulate demand. It's almost always some government action. Because government is the one body that doesn't have the same debt issues as a person. Governments don't necessarily have to make money. They don't necessarily have to make a profit. Governments collect taxes. Government makes laws. Governments have an army. You know, governments have a great advantage over individuals. Huge advantage. So they can afford to go into greater debt to get demand going. Then someday down the road they can pay it back or however your financial system set up. But we're an individual here. I don't want to spend money to buy stuff because I don't know what tomorrow's going to be. Government has a huge advantage that people don't have. And so like in 1873, we have the penny. And after that, the U.S. government gave land and grants to build like the Northern Pacific Railroad, the Southern Pacific Railroad. And remember, these transcontinentals require steel. That means production everywhere. 1893. Not the same things, but huge steel building and other manufacturers. 19, or in the, during the Great Depression, the U.S. government would build tens of thousands of miles of roads, buildings. In fact, almost all the infrastructure that we now take for granted today would be started during the New Deal. And then also the war, spending money out of that. And so those are examples of how the government can do it. And... The government doesn't have the same kind of debt issues, especially now. We don't have the same kind of debt issues at all. Back then, all the gold standards, you got to get gold. Now, what's the basis of the money? Bonds, or no. Credit, people want it. I mean, that's literally what it is. People want it. So there's nothing back. Just the, 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 the fact that people trust the United States to be here. And it's, oh my God, that's wild. Oh, it's, it's, it's really wild. That's, I mean, think about it for a second. People will give the United States money to get things that we print. Dollars. They loan the U.S. money for dollars. It's, 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 it's mind-boggling. My brain always Oh, it... So what do other countries back with their money? Same Japan does the same. Uh, the euro in, in England operates very much for gold standard, and that's why they have some serious problems in Europe, like Greece, because it operates like a gold standard. But Japan, but then you know, but but people trust the U.S. People don't trust places like Zimbabwe. So, also technological changes can really affect this. So, example, the eighteen nineties. The, the internal combustion engine and the new steel industry, 1920s, after the huge depression and panic of 1920, uh, cars, radios, uh, 1990s, there was a recession in 1993, but then the, the technology boom. Of course, should add almost all these are directly related to government. You know, there, there'd be no, there would have been no cars if the federal government wouldn't decide in 1921 to start building roads. Nobody would have bought a car. <laughs> I got this car. I could drive in a circle in my yard. <laughs> so, 
or like uh, the technology boom, the federal governments, the research by the federal government did like the internet and things like that. So they are tied together. But something's got to stimulate demand. And remember now, wages are low. And there's a lot of pent up demand. And people who don't have money, you know, they've been suffering. And so you give them a little bit of money and they'll spend it. You know, they need things. They've been putting off purchases in bad economic times. And so if something increases demand, like the government just literally just starts creating jobs. You know, we're going to build dams everywhere. Okay, that was the New Deal, the way. Canyon Ferry. It was a New Deal dam. It's a big dam building program. But <laughs> you just <laughs> say that. But eventually, if people start getting paychecks, and who cares where it's from? You they just start getting money. What do they do with it? They start spending. And that eventually companies begin to produce more. But here's the big thing. Eventually, okay, first they'll get more work out of the workers they already have, but here's the biggie. Eventually, what? What will happen to unemployment? They'll start doing what? When unemployment starts going down, that means more people with money in their hands. And what do they do with it? That means more demand. Remember how we had the little engine here about when it's overproduction that kind of leads to here or more demand cutbacks? Just imagine I'm circling to something here. Same thing here. More demand, low, drops unemployment, more, lower unemployment, more demand. And that is when you get the engine of growth. That's when you start going up. And here's where you get what happens to prices and profits. They begin to go up. And then what happens to banks? What happens to credit? Banks begin to finally realize, oh, we can start loaning money. They loosen, uh, they loosen credit. They make it easier to borrow and expand business. 2014. That's what's <coughs> here. And then the last thing, wages. Wages begin to go up. As companies begin to compete for workers, workers now have bargaining power to demand higher wages. And that seems to be happening right now. No, I don't know how big the boom will be. You know, that's, but that's the engine. So if this is the deflationary curve. What is this? Inflation. That's inflation. Now, here's the thing. So it leads to a very volatile economy. And you're gonna have a boom, fall by bust, boom, fall by bust. And it's that's what happens. You see it throughout history, up until 19, 1929, you see it about every decade. Boom, bust, boom, bust, boom, bust. Who benefits? <laughs> who's ever big, who survives? Who's ever big, who survives? Because think of the great advantage big has. Okay, companies going out of business, they might lose everything. But if they survive, what now, nah, what can they do to their competitors? Buy them, Buy them out or kill them off. And they get the market share. The big get bigger in a bust. And one more thing. If you're well survived, the big tanking here, whenever the crash hit, like maybe you're one of the uh, somebody's one of those people that sold just before the bubble burst. If they have wealth here, what happened to them? They got a lot of wealth. They got the wealth, and now there's deflation. The value they have goes up. The big that survive get bigger. So economies of scale is the iron rule. But think about how it's even more important here. Economies of scale. The big survive do well. Who doesn't do well? Small. Small. Wage or wage or small business really suffer. It's hard because they have less margin. And one more thing we have to add. There's a boom, there's a bust. So a lot of people leave, a few big survive. Another boom. Another bust. What's happening to the numbers of big each time? Smaller and smaller. Does that make sense? Each bus, there'll be fewer coming out good. Yeah. What happens if no one survives? 
Well, I mean, it could potentially happen. The entire economy is destroyed. But to, when Mars looked at this, he said, see, that's why the whole thing's rigged. Because you got a system where only a tiny percentage will have it, they'll rig the system and make sure they do. But then his, his prescription was, besides the workers controlling more of the means of production to avoid this, it was pretty vague. But still, the big, and one more thing to remember about wages, think, well, wait, wages are going back up. But if there are fewer companies competing for workers, what happens to wages? Even at a time when wages are going up, what happens? They don't go up to what they used to be. Yeah, it taps them down. It keeps wages low. That's why wages in 1873 were higher than 1893. That's why wages in 1973 were higher than today. Which is kind of weird to think about. Like how much? Hmm? How much higher? By the median salary? Yeah. It's, it's about five or six thousand dollars a year. So when the government Median's the middle. Right. Yeah. When the government helps um like to reinforce a new demand after a bus, how do they choose what companies they like want to help and what companies to just like? Or who? Or maybe they just want to help workers to buy stuff. So it could be like, who you help. Who, so how do they make that decision? That's where you, that's where the, that's the big decision. That's why this is so important today. So how we deal with a boom and bust is really that then about uh, political decisions. You know why you look back at this and say, oh, they made these decisions, and this is what we have to do. We're talking about then who do we help? And let's get to the key words here we mentioned because supply for demand. No, no, don't think in terms of abstract. Think of those who supply the goods, the suppliers of goods, the producers, or the people who buy them, the consumers. Who do you help? Which is more important? If you were setting policy, and this is government policy, that's real politics, not just winning or losing elections. These are the decisions that really do affect your life. In fact, these are the decisions that will affect everybody. Which is more important? Obviously, you need both, right? If you want goods and no one's there to supply it, <laughs> or no one's going to supply anything and no one's there to buy it, which is more important? And this, that's the political point of view. That's policy. And that's what really matters. That's the decision to be made. So when it comes down to politics, you know, in fact, it's a great advantage to keep everyone distracted, worried about who wins and loses elections, when this is what matters. Okay, I've said conservative and liberal economics. Which is it? Which is conservative, which is liberal? This is more conservative economics, help the suppliers. This is more liberal economics. So these are people who want to maintain capitalism and want to control the boom and the bust. And that's what it all comes right down to. How do we make sure we don't go into a full-fledged bust? And how do we get out of a bust? How do we avoid these here so we're going to get overheating, so to speak? And what happens when you do have long-term unemployment and a credit freeze? How do you get out of it? And so, like Hamilton, laissez-faire, all the way out today, we trickle down the supply side. Here, you know, Andrew Jackson instinctively was here. He just didn't quite know what to do. His idea, of, let's just get rid of banks, we don't have to worry about it. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. But then you see like the populists, the progressives, the New Deal, what's called Keynesian economics today. And so that's, yeah. So did they have like, is that also like a split party, like Republican, Democrats? Not really. In the 1880s, 1890s, both political parties were. That's what we got to get to the farmers, and they were like, no, we got to need something else. Today, Republicans are this, and the Democrats are split. Democrats are split. Do you have a question? No. Okay. Yeah. What did you call the New Deal? What kind of economics? New Deal. Very liberal. In fact, the economic term liberal will be coined by FDR. Economic. Yeah. So, um, do politicians tend to sort of unsettle the way? A little bit, yeah. In bad times, in bad times, you see people worry about demand more, and good times, worry about supply more. 
a lot, but not always. Also depends on who's giving them money. You know, I mean, there's lots of things, or who they are. You know, their, their beliefs on social Darwinism really does matter here. Their beliefs on social Darwinism, how their you know their core beliefs. So, like, why is it that today, like, like the beliefs no, Democrats are split. Well, yeah. That gives that gives Republicans a huge advantage, which is pretty obvious right now. Really, so so often you see that like it's stereotyped. But a lot of people don't even know what don't even they refer to, they talk about social issues, but they, this is economics. Okay. And uh, not that saying that either one is not making a value judgment, but that's this is economics. Yeah. And Democrats are all over the place. And that gives Republicans a great advantage politically. Yeah. Because they we're for this. I mean, it's a huge advantage. And the Democrats probably, if they ever solve that problem, you know, you might see it's kind of a switch and thing, but yeah. So in your opinion, which one? My opinion. Your opinion, which one do you think is the best? Yes. Well, we're not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> It's a progression. We talk about here, but don't we need a big crash to really get into it? Yes. And then I will show you. So we got, and we're still at a point where all of this about what government can do is still really new. And there's still, remember, capitalism is new still here. So let's get to what the farmers did, because the farmers saw this like, well, we need some kind of reform. So let me get back to this and write down agrarian reforms. Because it's interesting, you know, a lot of these seem to talk about the boom bikes big business, you think corporations and building, it's the farmers because of their, well, they're most susceptible to the problems of the market. Yeah. Why do you erase all that? Science. Did I turn that on? I think I did. Yeah, I don't have an easy answer for you. I know what I'm, my plan is, though, in about two months, I'll tell you exactly how to Cool. It'll make life so much easier for all of us. Yeah, yeah. Who agrees with me on that? Well, as well, because I, can't wait to learn most of I know what you're thinking. I actually do know. What I know what you want, and it's time. Stalin! Oh. <laughs> We're coming to solve it. Agrarian revolt. Because this is going to be a revolt against the system, but it's a revolt to save capitalism by reforming. These people weren't radicals, even though some were definitely influenced by socialism. They liked elements of capitalism, but they thought if we don't reform capitalism, what's going to happen? A full-scale revolution. They were terrified about, about that. For 60 years, there's going to be an overriding fear of revolution, an overriding fear. Yeah, so the great, you can see it ending in the Great Depression and the unparalleled prosperity afterwards, where everyone thought, oh, it's always going to be this way. No, no it's, it's not quite anymore. I mean, historically, things have changed. It's amazing how many people my age, though, don't realize that. Because you people have it so easy today. There, I'm doing my old curmudgeon thing. In my day! Actually, I... All I do, there's only one thing about that. Every generation says that. You say it too, right? You're probably looking at a freshman. It was so much harder when I was a freshman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So first off, let's see the farmers that, the farmers that directly affected their problems. No, the agrarian problems. The problems on the farm. Okay, this is the dog looks really creepy, doesn't it? It's really, really <laughs> and, but it's a cartoon. So, the biggest problem, we mentioned this before, farmers are always in debt. Remember, all it takes is one bad year. One bad year. So we've talked about this before. And so don't forget this. In every problem you see, remember that farmers have this overriding fear of debt. Not everyone has an issue with debt. But farmers, it's very immediate. You know, heck, one hailstorm and you might be destroyed. So, here's a couple of the problems. Though. First off, overproduction. They're really susceptible to those 
to that boom bust cycle. So think about farmers. When prices start going down, so they're getting less per bushel of corn. But they got that debt to pay. What do they got to do? They got to some way to make more money. Before you get to the cutbacks, maybe that we just sell a little bit more. A little bit more. The problem is, what is every other farmer doing? And after the Civil War, there's going to be a dramatic increase in land. Land that went under the plow, combination of Homestead Act, in the states of the former Confederacy, they cultivated more land because of the debt there. All this more land. Or farmers started buying up more land to sell more crop to get themselves out of debt. But more land, more production, even with the population going up, it still did not meet that. You combine that with overproduction issue with, they, they tie together mechanization. You know, a, a better windmill or a plow, but the big one is that reaper. Think about that mechanical reaper. Now you have a grain farm. So in 1870, what would it take in 10 people that one person could do? They cut that wheat down. Heck, by 1900, 20 people. One person could do the work of 20. Is that good for a farmer? Yes. Is that bad for a farmer? Yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. yes. Well, can you think about it for a second? Okay, now I can produce more. We've got the overproduction problem. And how are we able to afford that reaper debt? And if everyone's doing it, it's hard to get out of that cycle. And one more thing, you know, just something <coughs> more debt. Now you're tied to this uh, mechanization, so you need it. And what do you do with your kids? You don't need them anymore. Go away. <laughs> one of the greatest migrations in American history is going to be the internal migration of about the turn of the last century. When Families were too big on the farms. Like, what did they do? Go to the city. Go to the city. Good luck. Mm -hmm. Saw it again in the 1980s. It's kind of happening now. How Urgent. So with that, <laughs> so mechanization sounds good, like yay, farmers, but it's always more complex than that. And by the way, mechanization then will help what kind of farmers? The bigger you are, the more you can afford it. These economies of scale. So there's always going to be this push then to get bigger or to sell out or whatever it might be. Next, railroads. Railroads might sound good. Now I can get my goods to market. But boy, once you live someplace where you need the railroad, which by 1880s everywhere, now you're stuck. You're committed. And what they called it is price discrimination, because railroads would charge differently for different products. Price discrimination. And they would develop a term called a common carrier. Someone who, uh, their business carries goods or carries services for all kinds of people. So like for today, there's a lot of different common carriers. Railroads are the first one. Yeah, so the railroads need for price discrimination as they would answer the monopoly? Not necessarily, because railroads, they're an oligopoly. A lot of the time, they come up with the same kind of price issues. But railroads would do this all the time. Even, for the, even if they're not a monopoly, would a railroad charge more per ton for large, big loads or small loads? A lot more for small, exactly. Ideally, for a railroad, they'd like to one time load it, all one entire train of one product, and unload it all at one time. Think how much cheaper that is. Why do you think of that way? If you go to the High Line of Montana, if you can't fill up 109 grain cars, they won't take it. And that's a, what, like a section and a half of grain? I mean, that's, it's unreal how much. So that big, big, big. And will they charge more per mile for a long trip or a short trip? Significantly more for short trips. They don't want to stop a bunch of time. Wouldn't it be perfect if you load up one time in, let's say, Seattle and unload in Chicago? In fact, they would give it, write this down, rebates for big customers. They would give a huge bonus for big customers. They make deals with them. Rockefeller or Standard Oil would make all these deals. Make sure the railroads would be controlled. Um, 
Next week we're going to talk about Kansas. All roads lead to Kansas. We talk a little bit about the Progressive Bureau. I'll tell you about Standard Oil again, what that meant. And one more big thing now we'll get to monopolies. Think about what railroads could do if there's they're the only railroad in that area. So here's the Great Northern Railroad. Very profitable railroad up at the High Line, basically connecting Chicago to Seattle. Are, are they going to charge more to take grain out of Minnesota? Or a very good area for grain? This is a pretty good country for grain in northeastern Montana. Only about 25 times more. Now, so do get down monopolies. Where railroads have a monopoly, they charge significantly more. In areas where there's competition, then that allows them to cut their prices. Remember, undercutting, we talked about cutthroat competition. Happens today. There's one railroad in Montana Burlington Northern Santa Fe, which is this huge holding company. They charge about 10 times more to take grain out of the high line than out of Kansas because there's the Union Pacific Southern Pacific in Kansas. So that's what monopolies can do. And you can see it here. Just drive down the interstate. Places where the interstate didn't go, when they were making the interstate in the 60s and the 70s, I can remember this. Those places that didn't get the interstate, didn't get an exit, gone. Those are those places now that you do today, you just like, why do people even live there? Well, people used to. But when the interstate went by, same kind of thing. Heck, why do you think Tacoma is smaller than Seattle? The Northern Pacific went here, and the people of Seattle, slightly bigger harvest city, gave a big ride to go to Seattle. Seattle boomed, Tacoma still a big town, not even, the same, not even close to the same size. So that's the power these transportation companies have. This is huge. And they also have the warehouses and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I ninety. They want to go. They want to take ninety north of it because of the, they don't want to go over the pass. Yeah, and money was spent. Uh -huh. You wanted that interstate. It was a big deal when they're making the interstate. Who would get an access? Who would where access would be? Like that. Big. Hmm. Well, just look at here. You know the big deal about making. I still don't know why there's an exit on the south side of town, the South Hills. That that still never made sense to me. But that was something happened about 12 years ago. So with that, price discrimination. Oh, one more thing I almost forgot to say today. Has anyone ever looked at airline tickets? It's more expensive to fly from Helena to Salt Lake City than Los Angeles to New York. That's what we call a monopoly. Same issue. And we'll see the same kind of thing when it comes uh, to the internet. Because now they can start squeezing that off. It's a price competition. Yeah. It's cheaper to drive somewhere to get a different flight. But the problem with driving is then you have to pay, you know, then you, your time and, you know, if, it, if you're 12 hours in a car, that's time you lose. That's an opportunity cost. So, deflation. Deflation, that, but I know what you're saying. But you got to count that in. Oh, wait, not going to drive. You know, the Spokane or something. Deflation. Money, prices were dropping. Harder to pay back debts. But not only that, there was definite policy. I mentioned the coiny jack yesterday. Going on the gold standard. That's why farmers call it the crime of 73. Going on the gold standard, tack down the amount of money in circulation, and therefore, for farm prices, made it more difficult to pay back their, pay back their debt. Also, the federal, especially when you're on the gold standard, the federal government had to collect taxes, gold. And the tax system after 1873 was very regressive, based upon tariffs. So tariffs is a tax on imports. And if companies import goods and have to pay a tax, how do they pay that? How do they pay that tax? They pass the tax on to the consumer. That's exactly how those taxes are paid. You know, if you're a renter, your rent 
and property taxes go up, let's say, your rent will go up, you can pay for the property taxes. So that's how they pass on the taxes. What does regressive in this context mean? Sound effects. The lower your income, what happens to the amount you pay in taxes? Yes. Regressive so taxes means that the lower your income, the more you pay in taxes. So the wealthier you are, the less you pay. So these taxes are designed to tax working people, farmers, the poor, the vast majority of people. What kind of taxes? The tariffs are like what kind of tax? Today, we only have it on some goods. Some states have it on every good. Yeah. Sales tax? Yeah, sales tax. Sales taxes are specifically designed to give wealthy people a huge tax break. Yes? Our property taxes are middle of the road, but we have an income tax. So we have a slightly, it's not regressive, it's slightly called progressive, it the other way, income tax. But we have sales tax on something. Like we have gas tax. Like that tax. Today. But like you go to Washington, it's a what? It's an eight and a half or an eight percent tax. And you go to Seattle, they have a city tax of like three and a half percent. And you think about it, if you don't have much money, if you don't have much money, you have to pay an eight percent tax on everything. That really hits you. Yeah. Trying to buy something, they don't have to put the tax right. And you notice they don't put the tax credits because they don't want you to realize it. Okay, one more thing. That's why farmers wanted inflation. That's why they wanted to print greenbacks and make what's called fiat currency. Make the money what we have our money today. Or mint more silver coin to get inflation. Prices go up, easier to pay back your debt. Wages go up. By the way, how do banks feel about inflation? All of these things, oh, there are more problems, obviously. Have I mentioned drought? But all of these things do one important thing. They all increase debt, don't they? Everyone increases debt. So everything cycles back to debt. That is the one thing that's hanging over their head. All these problems like how are we going to pay back the bank? You can see why farmers might not like banks. Of course, nobody likes the person you owe money to. Don't loan money to a fund. That is very good advice. But here is taxes. And paying it to the cow in the form of a protective tariff. That's why there's protection on it. And who gets the milk? Yeah. And then here, the farmers warning about the power of these railroads, but all the people are just not paying attention as ties. I'm glad they don't show any more than that. Yeah, that was her. So. Well, we got to get this and put this in the margins. What happened is with all these issues, farmers realized we have to get involved in politics. These are all political decisions. So that's why I talked about the liberal and conservative, what that meant. These are farmers now saying we have to get involved because all the policies are designed basically, as we see it, rigged to help somebody else, somebody in a big city, and hurt us. There's a real urban-rural problem, even though farmers have many of the same problems that workers have. And the Grange with this organization, I know you saw this in the video, but let me tie this in with this whole thing. The Grange thought, let's get political. It's a farmer's organization, but after the panic of 73, they begin to push politicians to pass Granger laws. And these are going to be... What they're going to do is support whatever party, Republican or Democrat, remember now we're getting the 1880s, 1870s, 1880s, whichever one supports farmers' policies. So, for example, in Indiana or Ohio, they supported Republican, or Republicans, but in Iowa, they supported Democrats in this era. Whatever party. And the Granger laws regulated railroad rates. Regulated railroad rates. It's hard to say. It tried to end price discrimination. So no more big load, small load, about uh, monopolies or not monopolies. We will do something about that. They begin to pass laws within states. But railroads, 
you can imagine how they felt about these laws. They were, huh? How do you get rid of them? Okay, what do you call trade within a state? In, I heard both, but intra-state, across state borders. Hmm? Interstate. According to the Constitution, the federal government regulates interstate. So, for example, don't worry about Mud versus Illinois. We have to get to the court case. It's the Wabash Railroad versus Illinois. We just, I always call it. So, don't worry about Mun. You write down the Wabash Railroad case. The Wabash Railroad, part of the Illinois Central System, right here in Peoria. Let's say you're taking corn from Peoria to Chicago. Ever see where Peoria is right here? Just put a shot right there, right? They begin to go to Indianapolis and then back to Chicago. Illinois would try to regulate them and say, no, you can't regulate interstate commerce. It went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court threw out every grain law. Said they're all unconstitutional because of interstate commerce. And by the way, think about it for a second. Doesn't that mean basically it's impossible to regulate anything within the state? Can you, anybody think of more than one thing that you can buy or get in the state of Montana that does, a, does not involve some kind of interstate trade? That's what third period said, and that was it. That was it. I, it's hard to think of anything else. Because huckleberries don't, don't grow wild, flat and cherry juice fertilizer in my state. Is there another one? We all oh, it's all fertilizer from out of state. Virtually everything you use to cultivate it is not made in the state. Huh? Native, native, oh, nice fishing bowl you have there. Anything else? That's actually a good point. Did you say it up? But the point is, it's really hard for states to regulate things, isn't it? By the way, wouldn't it be a great way to try to get rid of like? Pollution regulations by saying we want the state to regulate. Yeah. I ever wonder why people say that all the time? They don't want regulations on coal, for example. It's a, this is it's it's a really big deal. This was a really important case. Really, do you really understand this? I said really like eight times. <laughs> now the Graves would do other things. They set up warehouses to store food. They even set up a farm insurance. <laughs> that they would sell insurance to farmers at good rates. The company's still around. Um, exactly. Farmers insurance are started by the Grange. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> even, even a mail order store called Montgomery Ward, which was created by the way, by the range, because farmers are pretty isolated to buy stuff. But they would die. By killing off the Granger laws, it just killed them. The Grange just couldn't survive. I mean, there's still a Grange, but politically, they realized. Both parties, we can't get them to cooperate. On the national level, they won't do it. We're going to have to do something else. And that's the thing. Politically, farmers felt very isolated. Very isolated. And they began after this, we need our own political structure. Because the political parties were not listening. Write down political machines. The urban political machines, okay, even if they might have common cause, they're urban, urban issues. And what political party were most of the urban political machines in this era? Democrats. The Democrats were the party of immigrants. The Democrats were the party of also the working class within these towns. And you might think, wait a second, wouldn't farmers and workers have something in common? Urban and rural seem really different. I mean, there is a dividing line. You know, we live in a big city, right? In the big city of Helena. Right? You know what I mean? We're going to the Zula, the Odon town like that. They don't understand big city issues like we do here. Actually, just compare Helena and go to New York City and realize things are issues in New York City might be different than Helena. Really? Slightly different point of view. It doesn't mean you can't find common cause, but it does, it just divided by that way. Yeah. 
New York City is, yeah. It might be completely in the entire They're thin and but it just, it, it's. What? Wait, one more thing. One more thing. Yeah. I just say Democrats, but Republicans did have like the state of Ohio. Or California, and it seems kind of weird today, but California was a Republican machine. No. LA was a total Republican machine. I mean, that totally just flipped in the 1990s. Much like Alabama flipped in the 1970s. Why? <laughs> You know, I come over and just say stuff. Oh, my God. I just want to say something. I well, what is it? Uh, 160 acres in a quarter. So, 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 and so, yeah, it's a are cool. Steam engines are like one of the neatest things we should build. That used to be a really popular toy to give the kids, like a mini steam engine. You put little bits of wood in there. Well, like, yeah, the train whistle things are so cool. Oh, the steam whistle? Yeah. Those are, yeah, those really are cool. They're ingenious. I mean, you don't need it today, but it is amazing. Oh, yeah. You probably could. In, in a very weird way, it, it is an art. Yeah. It's a different type of art. It's incredible. Okay, on the mass producer, it, but the actual creation of it. That's Thank <laughs> you. 
for it so no more horror movies get your pans out I'm actually tired today you know I didn't have a first or second period because of that assembly it's amazing how it takes a lot harder to all right, so the vote is in. And the leading vote getter was, drum roll. Gold Rush? No. <laughs> it was Colts. Yeah. Then Rebels and Revolutionaries, yes! Yes! Gangsters and Culture. And then famous crimes and criminals. So we'll do those. And then, and I am not making this is. Then there is a tie. We have disasters, uh, political scandals, and gold rush. We are going to do gold rush. <laughs> disasters. And then there's one more on here um, with a lot of votes, and that was toys. So we are going to make toys. Yeah. It's going to be like Santa for the workshop. <laughs> 14 hour days. I'll teach you about the trend. Sure, it's fine. Okay, so so we are we are probably going to do. I like we are going to do the gold rush. I don't know how long and toys. I, I do. I think that would be a fun one, but um, but I think disasters and political scandals also would be a good one. The reason I like those two is because that would be. Political channels and adapters are good ones for you to research on your own. You do a research, do a presentation. So I think those are going to be really good. So I'm still, I think I might do like a smaller one on gold, the gold rush. But I'm going to do the gold rush. One of the else, we got to do the uh, the Alaska, the Yukon gold rush is one of the most amazing things ever. You know what I'm talking about? 1898. It is just unreal. So it's such a good story. Maybe we can watch all the while, but. You ever read Call of the Wild? Yeah. Jack Ryan? Love Jack. <laughs> it's all about the gold rush. Yeah. Spoiler. Don't read Old Yeller. <laughs> Don't do it. Who's read Old Yeller? Yeah. Old Yeller. It's a great story. It's tough. I read that. I think I'll just. Oh my god! Just like read a book. It's terrible. The first book. No, it wasn't the first, but it was one of the first. I really want to read it. Okay, so. So and then we both finish up with digital rock and roll. So that sounds like a good. And I really like political scandals. That'll be fun. And that same thing. What I'll do that, I might take one scandal. What I'll do is I'll divide up a bunch of political scandals. And I figure out how I want to do Watergate. Watergate, I might do, I might break that up into like three or four parts. And it's that big. And I would maybe get some people would want to work together on that. Because Watergate is, Watergate's not real. And when people talk about political scandals, they say, we've never seen anything like this before. They have totally forgotten history. And no, we probably won't do anything about potential scandals now because we don't have any context. Of course, you never know in a month, but I don't see any. And so uh, I don't like doing things without at least a little bit of context. Because you a little bit of time to look back. Because right now, you know, things happen within the last 10 or 15 years. It's like, it's like really fresh in our minds. Even talking about the 2008 financial crisis is still... You remember that kind of, right? Yeah. Maybe not all the details, but it's 
you were old enough to remember stuff. I mean, I remember stuff when I was two. Robert McNamara remembers when he was one. He's, he's strange. That's his middle name, too. I know. <laughs> I know. All right, so I actually can remember something when I was was, was two. Flying monkeys. Flying monkeys. I was two and a half, and I can vividly remember Super Bowl four. Well, I remember that alert. Okay. So take out your notes. I was young. I was young. Last. Something that sticks, and also remember Bert and Ernie. It's very I watched the first set of I also watched the first uh, talking <laughs> motion picture. The, the jazz scene. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and get back to horribles. Are you excited for Bacon the Body Standards? Yeah. I, I, I actually have bad dreams <laughs> If you've ever, when you get to invasion of the body snatcher, the story is great. Okay, 50s movies, from our point of view, you know, we're so cosmic, all of them are sophisticated now. But, but that sounds like a pretty good stuff on this. I like, and uh, the wild card I think will be disastrous, but uh, I think that sounds good. A lot of people voted, and then there's a lot of things like, you know, a few different space race, exploration. I was really surprised you want more for 70s culture. American art? Only a couple for American art. But I might do an art. Yes. Just, just one day art. Yes. That actually was one of the fun things I, I always liked about AP Europe. Oh, the art day. Yeah, just do an art day like Impressionist art. That was, what was that one painting? 